Hi everybody. Uh, sorry I couldn't be here, but uh, we'll do the best we can. Uh, so I'm here to talk about Tube, which is an open movie project. It's uh, made with free and open source software. It's to be released under Creative Commons license, along with all of its production files. Tube is based on the ancient epic of Gilgamesh from Mesopotamia. Making a movie with open source software is uh, no longer a, um, a question. It's been answered. And so now the questions that we have to face uh, are slightly different. Uh, one of them is, uh, can we work um, like this, kind of spread around in a manner more resembling how a software project is run than the manner that a typical movie is made. In other words, we're not sitting in a studio uh, with, uh, you know, typically with tight deadlines and managers and so on and so forth. Instead, we're a bunch of volunteers working at our laptops. Somehow all of that work has to get coordinated. Uh, the question for the future that we'd like to answer is, can this kind of work grow and work for even bigger projects. You know, I mean, Tube is just a 10 minute short. That's still a lot of work, but can we do the same thing and make a feature film um, or a blockbuster game or something of that scale? So let's talk about some of the things that we're using to make Tube and how we get all of this to work. First of all, we use Blender for uh, 3D animation, rendering, modeling, and everything else 3D. We're also using some of the other software whose developers are probably somewhere in the crowd here. So, you know, if you're if you're a MyPaint or GIMP or Krita or Inkscape developer, thanks. Um, we're using all your software. We're also writing a bunch of our own tools in addition to that. So we've written a tool that we use to extract dependencies, uh, which is we just call it Package Maker. It doesn't have a very fancy name. Um, but what it does is it can uh, read a bunch of uh, Blender files, you know, source files essentially, and find out what files are depending on what. It's using uh, a library called BlenderAid to accomplish this. And then it basically pulls those files out of SVN, uh, makes a tight little package and sends that off uh, to the animator, uh, thus allowing them not to interact with the entire project all at once. Other tools that we use to make the um, production go smoother are making it easier for artists to kind of pick and choose assets from different parts of the pro project and then plug them into shots. Um, and so the tool that we use for that uh, is called Reference Desk and it was written by Chris Weber and um, of Media Goblin fame. It uh, has a JSON file that describes the project and uh, basically per asset lists um, objects and scripts that need to be imported and or run in order to make the particular thing, let's say the character, Gilgamesh, appear in a shot. And all the animator has to do is pick that out in a list, click a button, and there she is, ready to go. Um, and um, future versions of Blender are going to have something really similar uh, incorporated into Blender itself and Reference Desk was actually one of the kind of um, uh, reference programs that the Blender developer used to build the Blender Asset Browser. Some of the tools that we're using for pipeline needs um, is uh, something called Blendflakes. Uh, those of you who program in Python might be familiar with Pyflakes, um, which it basically is, functions as a kind of a lint or style checker. There, there are a few other little helping things here and there scattered throughout the projects, like ways to go between high resolution and low resolution versions of objects very easily. And um, there's a lot of room for improvement. So if you're interested in this kind of work and you want to kind of join us, uh, observe what's going on and maybe help at the end of the project develop the next generation of these tools, um, I'm really excited to work with people uh, doing that kind of stuff. Um, and just to kind of make things more exciting, we'll talk about more animation-y fun stuff. So our uh, biggest two tools are our crowd and auto walking tools and our rigging tools. And I'm going to talk about the crowd stuff first because it's more fun. So if you run out of time, that's cool. Uh, so we have a bunch of shots where we have large groups of creatures moving around. Uh, specifically, um, in the first 
In, in fact, throughout the entire movie, there are some shots scattered around with lots of cockroaches running around. And towards the end of the movie, there are some shots where there are huge crowds of people. Um, and uh, in both cases, uh, it would really be too slow and tedious for somebody to go down and animate every single one of these things walking around. Because you have to plant their feet and they have to stay glued to the ground and their weight has to shift convincingly. And, and then you just do it, you know, for 50 characters in a shot. No, that's not possible. Um, so we kind of split the problem into two halves. Uh, we said first we need to simulate the crowd behavior. And so we just treat each, each character as just a block. And those blocks have to mill about. Maybe they run away from something that they're scared from. Uh, maybe they go towards something that they like. Uh, maybe they're just random, depending on the shot. Um, and um, and they're just blocks. They don't walk or, you know, beyond moving around, you don't see any animation inside of them. And so we actually came up with four different ways to do this. Now we can make them look like something. Uh, so we have our auto walker script, which um, does a little bit more than auto walking. So we define a character as being a rig and a mesh. And what the script does it, for those blocky objects that are moving along the path, first thing it does, it substitutes them for our character with its rig. The second thing it does is that it adds procedural animation on top of that rig. Um, that is based on the motion. Um, and I don't think I have time to get into this in too much detail, but it's pretty neat. And there's a, web, uh, there's a video of it on our website, I think, that might be explaining how the technique works. Um, and so the result of this is that you have um, a bunch of, uh, let's say cockroaches, because that's what we have right now, uh, that are moving around on screen. And you can set them up to, uh, in a real-time way, uh, do their little walk and uh, they have a we have an interface so you can start dialing in different parameters for the walk so you can specify how long the stride is how far apart the legs are if the body's like hanging back or going forward or if like they're bobbing up and down like mad or whatever right and you can do it like one by one or you can do it for a little clump of characters or you can do it for the whole crowd all at once and once you're done, you can bake that out. And once again, you get animation curves, but this time they're on the individual kind of feet and body and components of the characters. And that's it. You have your crowd and you're ready to render. One thing about it that is uh, kind of limited right now is that um, all the kind of parameters and the animations are set up for the one rig, for the cockroach rig. And obviously, that's not even good enough for us because we need to make that more general to the human characters later on. And the idea is, instead of writing a second version of the script that works in humans and publishing that, <coughs> we're going to modify the script so it will actually ingest a character rig that's set up in a certain way and then use that for the crowd. And so that means that future users of the script will have uh, a neat set of documentation which will convert kind of any character into a crowd simmable character and then they can just run the script on that and have a crowd of whatever that was. Um, and that will not involve writing any new code to do it, just using our script to do it. So that'll be pretty cool. We have some stuff for, you know, um, parametric aging and growing of things. So we can do long time lapse sequences where things are changing over time. Um, and we have scripts for kind of the back end of the animation business, which is setting up the characters to be animated. Uh, so we have um, something called Rigamarule, which is to help riggers make rigs. And uh, rigs are kind of like, you know, they're like machines or skeletons that move the characters about. And they're pretty complicated. There's like hundreds of elements interacting in very precise ways. What Rigamarule does, it, it replaces kind of hand tweaking of all these elements with sort of a rule-based system that allows like the spatial coherency of the parts of the rig to be based off of the joint positions. Um, and that allows 
two things. It allows to keep your rig kind of intact and functional as you're making it. It also makes it very easy to copy the rig to something else and stretch it around and have it still not break. Um, and a third benefit that we found is that you can use it to kind of record very specific setups and then sort of play them back onto a character. You know, you can get that same functionality repeated in different places. Um, and one example of that we can show here is uh, something called Raymond Curver. It allows you to take a limb and make it, you know, rubber hosey where you can bend it in the middle and make it like wiggle about like an old 1920s animation. The reason rigmarole helps here is normally you could just, you know, script making all those elements and have that work. Um, but using rigmarole for that means that you make it once, but you use the rules uh, to set up that first time you do it. And the rules are basically Python dictionaries. And so you can copy those dictionaries, throw them into your script, and then the script just plays it back. And so basically, instead of writing a bunch of code, you just do a bunch of clicking in the UI, and then you get what you need for your scripted setup. And so you can use it to automate um, various setups that you want um, via code, but without writing a lot of code, um, if that makes any sense. Um, and so that's pretty helpful. I'm sure I'll be using that quite a bit in the future, and hopefully other people will use it. Um, it's a bit more technical to use than, you know, an RS tool because you have to actually be using Python to be, to benefit from it. So there are many more tools in our project that uh, help us in small or big ways. Uh, some of them are pipeline related. Some of them are actually used to generate animation or things that you see on the screen. And there's not enough time to go over all of them right now, but um, you can probably go to our website and uh, check out some of them. And in any case, all of them are going to get released at the end of the project. And I'm pretty sure I'm out of time right now, so I'm going to say um, stop right here and open it up for questions uh, if and if you have any.